The agricultural giant Monsanto brought the herbicide glyphosate to the market in the 1970s under the name Roundup. Monsanto's patent has long expired, but they're still among roughly 20 companies selling a glyphosate herbicide in Canada. In fact, last year, 8 million litres were used in central and eastern Canada, with Ontario farmers accounting for 80% of that use. In March, the WHO's International Agency for Research on Cancer declared glyphosate as, quote, probably carcinogenic to humans, setting off a debate which we're going to continue right now. So, joining us for more in Montreal, Quebec, Joseph A. Schwartz. He is host of The Dr. Joe Show. That's on Montreal's CJAD Radio. He's also director of McGill University's Office for Science and Society. And with us here in studio, John McLaughlin, Chief Science Officer with Public Health Ontario, scientist at University of Toronto, and part of the team that just released the aforementioned report on glyphosate. And it's good to welcome both of you gentlemen to our program tonight. Uh, Dr. Joe, starting with you first, how important, in your view, is glyphosate to Canada's agricultural business? I think it's very important. Uh, in Canada, of course, we grow a lot of canola, a lot of uh, corn, a lot of soy, and a large percentage of that is uh, genetically modified to resist uh, herbicide. And the herbicide, of course, that we're talking about is Roundup or glyphosate. Uh, glyphosate is used in other uh, venues as well. It, it's used in forestry industry. It's used to, you know, control weeds in in, uh, in parks. It's a very important uh, herbicide. When did you, John McLaughlin, first get the inkling that it might be hazardous, dangerous, use the word that you want to use, to human health? Well, we did a study in Canada back about 20 years ago. Uh, six regions of the country participated in it. We published a paper in 2001 where we actually reported an association between glyphosate and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. That was the first time we were aware of anything at all. And it was contrary to what we expected because we had understood that it was not likely to, be, uh, to have any human health effect. And it's actually taken since 2001 until now to have uh, additional evidence beginning to emerge so that uh, the international agency made its recommendation. Health Canada is doing an investigation right now. They are out for public consultations. And here's what they have to say about this on their website. The World Health Organization's International Agency for Research on Cancer recently assigned a hazard classification for glyphosate as, quote, probably carcinogenic to humans. It is important to note that a hazard classification is not a health risk assessment. The level of human exposure, which determines the actual risk, was not taken into account by WHO. Pesticides are registered for use in Canada only if the level of exposure to Canadians does not cause any harmful effects, including cancer. John, a follow-up here. What's the difference between a hazard and a health risk? Steve, that's a very good question. And we've, um, in epidemiology, I'm a, I'm a health researcher. We look at this often. The hazard assessment that the international agency conducted was looking at, in some ways, a worst case scenario. If, in fact, something was at a relatively high level of exposure, whether that could give rise to, in this situation, cancer. That was our focus. The uh, regulatory agencies, such as Health Canada, would do what's called a risk assessment, where they try to assess at the levels of use, as are in, in, in the instructions, such as on a label, would those levels of use, as are approved, give rise to health effects. And it's important for a regulatory agency to identify those doses or those levels of exposure that would not give rise to health effects. So the, the two um, results are actually quite compatible. Ours was a bit like the, at the high level, is this possibly a concern? The answer is yes. Glyphosate appears to probably be a carcinogen. But if used the way it's recommended, we would not expect, given uh, the, the risk assessment that's been done by Health Canada, that in, as instructed, those levels should not give rise to um, cancer or other important health effects. Let me go to Joe Schwartz on this. That, there is a distinction there. Do you think that is a distinction the public understands? Uh, perhaps an analogy might uh, help here. Uh, I think everyone would agree that a grizzly bear is a hazard. If you meet one in the wild, I think you want to turn around and run the other way fast, or at least faster than one of your friends. Uh, <laughs> however, if you see a grizzly bear in a zoo, it's a completely different situation. So there is an innate 
hazard that is associated with the grizzly bear, but the risk depends on several other factors. It depends on exposure, how you're exposed, and also on personal vulnerability. So when we refer to something as a carcinogen, it means that it has the potential of causing cancer, not that it does in a particular situation. And that's why when Health Canada looks at regulations, they look not only at the hazard, but they look at the risk. And risk takes into account extent of exposure and uh, uh, personal uh, liabilities. And so as far as you're concerned, if used properly, this grizzly bear is behind a cage in a zoo. Yes. And uh, you know, it's, I think, also important to understand that nothing in life is risk-free. There are many decisions that we make based upon a risk-benefit ratio. And all we can say in the realm of science at any given time is that the benefits outweigh the risks. I don't think we ever want to go out on a limb and say that something has zero risk associated with it because when used in one particular situation, such as high exposure, which might happen in an occupational setting, uh, there could conceivably be a problem. But I think as far as the general public is concerned, uh, fears have been raised about uh, residues of glyphosate on food, and I think that this is not a realistic concern. Uh, it's uh, just a question of having uh, very, very good analytical capabilities these days. We can find things down to parts per billion or parts per trillion even. Mm. But the fact is that just because something is there doesn't mean that it is harmful. It just means that analytical chemists are very capable of finding very small traces of uh, materials. Well, let me go on and do a follow-up with you, John, on how good chemists are in this regard. And I'm going to take you back to 2013, a toxicology review by a German institute called the German Federal Institute for Risk Assessment. And apparently they concluded that on the risk of cancer, including non-Hodgkin lymphoma, Quote, available data is contradictory and far from being convincing. So what new information were you looking at mm. to bring you to your determination? I was part of an international team of scientists from uh, uh, many different disciplines. We looked at the worldwide literature in many different areas, including human health studies, toxicology, animal studies, which would have actually been the same set of data that some of the other uh, regulatory agencies in Germany, the United States, and Canada would have also reviewed. The specific new thing that was part of the, the international agency's review was, was to uh, apply the, the relatively new knowledge about the mechanisms that under, un, are underlying cancer. And the historical patterns or the historical understanding of how cancer occurred, it was really heavily based on genetics. The new knowledge is really that it's much more complicated than that. It's the, the way the, the genes are themselves expressed, which is all determined by the cell environment. Epigenetics. Persons in epigenetics is an extremely important area of research now, mm -hmm. and it's real. We can see this is real. Science has then better characterized what these mechanisms are, and those, uh, those data about the mechanisms were actually included in the International Agency's review. The, the second uh, piece that's probably new is, relates to epigenetics, so the way the, the environment itself is influencing how the genome is expressed. And that is that it's really complicated. There's a lot of complexity. And that which we thought was fairly well understood before, we can see that with uh, little things like uh, bacteria in the gut or bacteria in the soil, that the, the microbiome is what it's referred to with the bacteria in our, our gut. It's a very, very important determinant of how, what the world is, what are, what's in our food, uh, what's in our environment, how our bodies are influenced by that. So, this is a part of the complexity that's been better understood now. Let me follow up with Joe about that bacteria that you just <coughs> referred to. There are claims being made, Dr. Joe. Uh, Dr. Stephanie Seneff from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, she says that glyphosate residue in our food can lead to a whole host of problems, including <coughs> multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, cancer, autism. How seriously do you take those claims? I don't think we take those seriously. I don't think we take uh, Dr. Seneff seriously in the scientific community. She uh, has some accomplishments in, in different areas, uh, in electrical engineering and in computer science, but she has no background in biology or epidemiology or, or agronomics. She has uh, sort of gone through the scientific literature and cherry-picked some data to conform to her pre-existing ideas. 
and uh, she has been widely criticized by experts. Basically, she makes the classic mistake of, of inferring cause from an association. And uh, she claims that because glyphosate has been uh, used increasingly and autism has increased, that there is a link between these two. Uh, no serious scientific researcher thinks that that is the case. Uh, the paper was published in a, in a journal that is, we kind of refer in the trade to as a pay for play journal. Uh, it, you can get anything published in there as long as you pay your, your fees. So I don't think that that can be looked at uh, seriously. There, there's a lot of very, very good research on, on autism spectrum, and uh, uh, the people who work in that area don't think that glyphosate is a major player there. Genetics are important. There's a lot uh, being looked into now about uh, pregnancy and uh, hypertension or uh, gestational diabetes. That is a much more likely uh, factor in autism than, than glyphosate. So I don't think that there's a, an issue there. John, very quickly, Dr. Seneff's work at MIT, do you place any stake in it? I would agree with what Joe has just described. Uh, seeing, uh, seeing associations that, are, that doesn't infer causality at all, that something like autism is very complex. There are many different uh, other correlates with uh, complex outcomes. and. One of the solutions to this is uh, asking the question, well, why is it that we don't have a better handle on what the real exposures are that sometimes are more common, more serious, and what are the health outcomes associated with that? The plea there might be that if we were to invest in the same way about environmental effects, we, in the same way that we have done in certain other areas of genetics and genomics, we could actually better understand some of these things and distinguish the nonsensical associations with the really important and useful ones. Gotcha. Uh, Joe, I want to go back to you on this. Monsanto, as you know, is taking an awful lot of heat about this, particularly from the anti-GMO folks. Uh, we just did a segment earlier in the program with uh, a woman who calls herself the science babe, uh, Yvette Dontremont. Her job is to, as she puts it, uh, go on the web, find bad science, and debunk it. She has... Um, Perhaps not totally, well, I guess, yeah, she kind of jokingly referred to them as um, evil Monsanto, right? Uh, that's what you hear all the time. Given that there are 20 other companies, though, that are selling this glyphosate herbicide in Canada, uh, how fair do you think it is to pin that label on them? Well, uh, Monsanto has sort of become a lightning rod for <laughs> everything that's bad in the world, and it isn't reasonable. Uh, they, they have made some mistakes in the past in terms of the way that they promoted their products and, and you know, political kind of mistakes, but I don't think that they have made a lot of scientific uh, errors. Uh, much of the criticism, of course, is, is unfounded and, and comes from people who, for various reasons, are opposed to genetic modification, usually not very strongly backed by, by science. So uh, Monsanto... Um, is just one of many, many seed companies, and they don't deserve all of the, you know, attack that has been uh, foisted. Okay, uh, having said that, let me follow up with this. There, there are programs out there, for example, Ontario's cosmetic pesticide ban, which includes Roundup. Do you think that's an effective way to reduce the cancer risk from exposure to glyphosate? I don't think so. Uh, th there, there are other pesticides, of course, that are widely used in, in so-called cosmetic, uh, you know, uh, lawn care industry. Uh, I, I think when we look at the lawn care industry, it's a very different story from looking at agriculture, because uh, it's not essential. You can live with the dandelions on your lawn. So there you may want to exercise the so-called precautionary principle and, you know, if there's any risk associated with something, then you may want to make sure that you reduce that. But that's very different from uh, crops, which are needed to feed an ever-increasing population in the world. So you can't look at those the same way. And uh, also, I, I think that there has been um, a lot of sort of misguided effort in the lawn care uh, uh, area. Well, let me Although jump in I, here because you know, I'm down to 20 seconds left and I want to ask John, would you put Roundup on your lawn? Uh, I don't see the benefits in my mind. The, 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 the benefits of uh, fewer weeds are not worth the risks or the cost of the product. Gotcha. And it's not that the risks are health risks, it's just that I don't see the benefits. Understood. Joseph Schwartz, thanks for joining us on the line from Montreal, Quebec. It's good to have you there. And uh, for those who are interested, the Dr. Joe Show on CJAD, the longest-running call-in radio program on science 
in Canadian history. So good for you and keep it going. John McLaughlin, University of Toronto, Public Health Ontario, thank you for being here in our studios as well. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.